Brilliant. So hello and welcome everybody to this launch event for the Women in Sustainability in Newcastle report, Why Being Heard is Not Enough. I'm Rianne Sherrington. I'm the founder of the Women in Sustainability Network, helping female change makers access the confidence, courage and community to lead and be a force for good. I'm also joined by Dr. Jenny Davidson, who is the, uh, the Executive MBA Programme Director at the Newcastle University Business School. She's also the Winds Newcastle Hub Lead and co-author of our report. I want to extend a really warm welcome to our two very special guests that you can see on your screen, who have joined us today for what we're calling a listening event. So let me briefly introduce you to them before we sort of dive into the, the whole topic of our conversation. So a very highly regarded current affairs commentator, broadcaster and best selling author, Marianne Seekhart whose brilliant book, The Authority Gap, looks at how we still don't take women uh, seriously and what we can do about it. She's a visiting professor at King's College London, and she's a non-executive director for the Guardian Media Group, for um, Parthian International and the Merchants Trust, both of which are equity income investment um, trusts. Hello, Marianne. Hi, Rianne. Lovely to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. And then just dubbed by some media as the first environmentalist to run a UK bank, Dr. Bevis Watts is the chief executive for Trudos Bank UK since uh, April 2016. Prior to that, he was head of business banking. Bevis has spent over 20 years working in the sustainability sector from public, private and voluntary sectors, and he holds a number of numerous uh, directorships and trusteeships. Hello, Bevis. Hello, Rianne. Hello, all. Uh, great privilege to be part of today. So thank you. Thank you, Bevis. And uh, finally, uh, but by no means least, let me introduce us, introduce you to our fabulous facilitator. Um, her very apt LinkedIn profile states that she is a human how-to guide for your sustainability journey. Sherry Lee Miles is co-director of Net Positive Futures, who helps organizations and networks understand how sustainability links directly into organizational excellence. They develop the people, the processes, the systems, and the strategy to embed sustainability practically. She's also director of a social enterprise uh, and workers cooperative called Four Seasons. And as she said herself in the chat before we started, she's a WINS super fan and has been involved in a network for many, many years. Welcome, Sherry Lee. Thanks, Rianne. Oh, nice to be here. Can't wait to be to start listening. Brilliant. OK, so before I hand over to Jenny, who's actually going to set the context of why we did this research, I just want to also um, thank you for giving up your lunchtime, for joining us here today for the for this conversation. Um, do uh, as you are doing, do introduce yourselves in the chat. And, and as we go along, please post your thoughts, put in your questions. We will be putting questions to our panel uh, and we are going to be also inviting you to go into some breakout rooms further on uh, in this event so you can really dive in and discuss what we've been exploring. So that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Jenny who's going to send the, set a bit of the context for why we did this research. Thanks Rianne. Good afternoon everybody. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Um, just a little bit from me about the background to the to the survey that we've done in the, the report and our initial findings. So um, the report and, and the conversations that we're going to be having today are really around the very initial findings from our first ever survey of its kind from the Women in Sustainability Network um, that we conducted last summer. And I think in the written introductions in the report, Rianne and I both talk about um, how it felt like the right time to go out and ask some of these questions of women working in sustainability. Um, some of the obvious things around um, COP26 was on the horizon last spring, and um, we just felt that there was a growing narrative, a growing discourse around the role of women in sustainability. And we knew that we had this great community of women that we could turn to and, and start to ask some questions about some of the systemic barriers that they were facing as practitioners in, in this space. But crucially as well, about some of the solutions um, to some to breaking down some of those some of those barriers. I, I think probably as well, I should also declare that um, it was a, a really a great opportunity for me to explore my lived experience as a woman in sustainability and um, just to really start to explore some of my own um, 
I suppose some of the barriers that I had experienced as a woman working in, in the sector. So um, our study focuses on women or um, individuals who identify as women, um, mostly leaders who work within the sector. Um, and these results that we're sharing are very much the initial findings. We didn't have to dig or excavate very deep to, to come up with some really um, very clear signals from our community. And um, in terms of those, the women that we um, approached to take part in the survey, I'll talk a little bit more about the data itself later on, but um, we, we turned in the first instance to the existing um, Women in Sustainability Network, but we then also invited through our social media campaign for people to, to draw on colleagues and, um, and advocates to also to help to, um, to, to fill out the survey. So I'll talk a little bit more about how we went about collecting the data in, in, in a minute. Um, we're hoping that this is just the beginning. We're hoping that we will um, we will excavate this data and we'll um, analyze this data even more and that we'll be coming back to you with some, um, some more of our findings having done that. Um, and can't emphasize enough, the um, study and the report is really about the pursuit is in the pursuit of some solutions and that those solutions will extend beyond the Women in Sustainability Network um, to the wider community. So um, I'm going to pause there and I will be back in back shortly, as I said, to talk a little bit more about um, the uh, how we found the data and also um, some of the sort of the, the backgrounds and the, the women that responded. But for now, I'm going to pass over to Sherry Lee, who is going to be uh, leading us today, I think, with the right word, facilitating. <laughs> thanks, Jenny. Uh, thanks, Rianne. Uh, I want to hear as much as possible from our fabulous panellists. So I'm going to kick off, Marianne, if I may, with a question for you. So based on your research and experience, tell us what happens uh, to women when they speak up. Well, first of all, women on the whole don't speak up as much as men do. So almost, in fact, every, I think, academic study shows that in public settings, at least, men talk more than women do. And a lot of them indulge in what I call conversational man, man spreading. You know, they just take up too much of the conversational time, disproportionate amount um, compared with their numbers in the room. And I mean, a, a lovely experiment, um, which always makes me laugh, asked men and women to, they gave them a tape recorder and they showed them two paintings and they said, talk for as long as you like about these paintings into the tape recorder. The women spoke on average for 3.17 minutes. The men spoke on average for 13 minutes, in other words, four times as long. But even that wasn't accurate because three of the men were still talking when their 30 minute cassette tapes ran out. Uh, this is just an indication of how much more in general men speak than women. But when women do speak up, they have extra handicaps. So they're much more likely, for instance, to be interrupted or talked over than men. And this is even in the most senior authoritative positions. So for instance, a, a recent study was done of US Supreme Court proceedings, and you don't get much more authoritative than being a US Supreme Court justice. And they found that women make up only a third of the justices, but suffer two thirds of all interruptions. In other words, they're four times more likely to be interrupted than their male colleagues, 96% of the time by men. So this is what tends to happen when women speak up. Now, I think we'll probably go on to influence later, so I'll stop there. Thanks, Marianne. I mean, it, it, it's instantly fascinating, isn't it? Bevis, I'm going to bring you in at this point, not to ask you how often you interrupt, but to share a little bit from your own perspective about what you think the benefits are of being more of a facilitator, more supportive of uh, female voices and female leadership, either from your sort of personal perspective or, or as a business. Yeah, thank you. And uh, since I did an event with um, Marianne in December, I've I've really noticed the interruption thing uh, in my own business and, uh, and uh, it really opened my eyes. So, um, yeah, I mean, personally, why I think this agenda should matter for men, really. I mean, there's uh, some lived experience in my life, having had a, in my teens a father who was terminally ill and then, and then passed away, seeing what difference it makes in the world when the perceived sort of authority figure is absent in the household and how um, more challenging some daft things in life become uh, off the back of that. But then in my professional career, the people that have influenced me most uh, and been most influential in my career are women. So I was very fortunate to work uh, and do my postgraduate work with a lady called Jane Prober, who's now retired at Swansea University, 
but she was a mathematical modeler and she was a real pioneer in teaching corporate environmental management and pollution modeling as it was then uh, but really inspired me and set me on the whole path I've been on for the last 25 years and also when I first became a, a CEO nearly 10 years ago uh, the, the lady Ros Kidman Cox um, uh, who was um, previously editor of BBC Wildlife magazine she's now chair of judges for Wildlife Photographer of the Year but an amazing woman who was just very nurturing and just gave me huge confidence in in that nurturing style to be a CEO for the first time so those two really stand out for me I, I currently have a great chair who is a man but uh, but those two really stand out as having had major influences on me and my career so I see myself really as a product and a beneficiary of diverse leadership and uh, and I don't I know consciously I don't respond well in an alpha male environment and probably a dark period of my life was going to an all boys school for five years which prepares you for nothing except prison I think it's just a, a hopeless paradigm but um but yeah I, those are the kind of things why I think this should matter to more men and realize that actually more men will flourish and be them best selves when we have more diverse leadership and more female voices uh, uh, heard and and uh, influential Thanks, Marianne. Do you want to come back on that? And I'm interested in how important it is to you that this that there are men listening to these conversations. Yes. Um, so often we're told that actually women have got to be fixed. And what my book shows is that it's not women that need fixing. It's the way we perceive women and the way we interact with women that needs fixing. It's a systemic problem. And when I say we, I mean, women as well as men, it's mainly men, to be honest, but women too suffer from unconscious bias against women, from sort of internalized misogyny because of the world in which we've all been brought up. Most of us have grown up in families in which, you know, Bevis was talking about his father being the authority figure. Most of us have been brought up in families in which our father earns more than our mother, probably worked more than our mother, possibly had more authority at home than our mother. And we've all grown up in a world in which men are basically in charge and therefore, we all really nurture this unconscious bias that associates male much more than female with authority. And that's something that we've got to deal with men as well as women. And what worries me is that at this sort of event, which is fantastic, the audience is almost entirely female, <laughs> but the world won't change unless men start getting interested in this sort of thing as well. And we see this in all sorts of patterns in life that women will read books written by men. Men are much more reluctant to read books written by women. Women will follow men on Twitter. Men are much more reluctant to follow women on Twitter. So if then if they're not even letting us into their news feeds, as it were, if they're not even reading our books, how are they ever going to a have a complete view of the world and b understand these sorts of issues which really need men to to join in? And before I ask Bevis for his thoughts on this, is, is, it, is that any sign of a shift? Is there some good news on the horizon? Is it getting easier? Um, Mary Ann, I'm, I ask, can I ask you first before I go to bed? Here? Yeah, uh, no, it is, it is definitely improving. I think we've seen quite an improvement, oddly since Me Too. I think Me Too has allowed, has somehow given license for women to speak out more, not just about sexual assault and harassment, but just about all the shit that we have to put up with in life and the sexist problems. Um, and, I, and I think that has made at least some men sit up and think about it. I mean, in my experience, completely anecdotally, men divide into three. So there's a third of men like Bevis who are fantastic and they are allies to us and they listen to us as attentively as they do to men and they treat us absolutely equally and respect us equally. We love men like that. We really notice, we really appreciate it. And then there's about another third of men at the opposite end of the spectrum who are not just covert sexists, but overt sexists and genuinely believe they're superior and are, are basically dinosaurs. But then I think there's you know, about a third of men in the middle who aren't actively maligned towards women, but just don't notice that they're doing this sort of thing. They don't notice that they listen less to us, that they're more reluctant to be influenced by us, that they interrupt us more, that they underestimate our ability. And it's only once we start pointing it out to them that they might think, oh, goodness, yes, I guess that is the way I'm behaving and I could do something about it if I wanted to. And those are the men that I really wish would listen to this sort of session. Uh, so they can start just to rethink 
the, you know, the tram lines they've been on all their lives without even really noticing it. And I think once we recruit those men to the third that Bevis is in, <clears throat> then we've got two thirds of men who care about this issue and want to do something about it. And that I think will marginalize the dinosaurs so that the way they behave will really no longer become acceptable. Other men will call it out as well as women. And I think it's a bit like racism was 10 or 20 years ago, you know, in a room full of white people, one of them might feel they have permission to tell a casually racist joke and get away with it. They can't do that anymore, thank goodness. And, you know, I really hope that sexism will go that way too. Yeah, and we, you know, we do like a tipping point in the sustainability world. Bevis, is that your experience? Are you noticing that more men are taking an active interest in gender issues more broadly? Oh, I, I think we need to be careful because we can all live in bubbles. <laughs> and, uh, and I work for a you know, purpose-led organisation with strong values and, and with a lot of sort of, I think, enlightened men. And I'm, I, I'm not naive to think I think the world has a long way to shift. Um, I, I think I, I've tried to be very curious and open up more conversations with my male colleagues around this sort of thirds uh, sort of scenario that, um, that um, Marianne uh, articulated. Um, because, you know, I still think I can do a lot more and I've consciously tried to recognise where people are being interrupted and cut across, and, uh, cut across in meetings and say, well, can we just let her finish uh, and, and, and call that out? But then have a quiet word with people uh, in the background. But, you know, th those are some of the small things. I mean, systemically as a business, I still think we can all do so much more around um, uh, you know, parental leave, how we look at that, how we look at the, the roles in sort of bringing up children and, and, and domestically and... Uh, we haven't got um, various things still right. Uh, job shares, I think, are very hard to work in certain regulated roles within a bank and things like that. So there's so much more we can wrestle with, even if um, uh, Marianne's very kind in putting me in the, 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 the kind of uh, certificated third. But I see, you know, we have to have a role in really trying to engage more colleagues from the other third into that conversation, calling out the people uh, who are perhaps um, not open-minded to issues, even realising they're having negative impacts on people and organisations through, through how they behave. Fabulous. Right. I think it's time for us to start looking at where our own research has taken us. I'm going to hand over to uh, Jenny now, if it's OK. Let's get into the nitty gritty of what we found. Thanks, Sherry Lee. Um, yeah, a, a little bit of an introduction as to who, um, who responded to our survey really to start so that you've got a sense of um, who, we're, who we're representing as part of the, um, the rest of the report. Um, we, um, as I've already mentioned, we started to, with the WINS network in terms of inviting members who were already engaged with us to respond to our survey and then embarked on a, um, a social media campaign to, with the aim of, of hearing a thousand voices of women or those who identified as women who worked in the sustainability sector. Um, and we got a 606 respondents. So we were pretty, we were pretty happy with that. Um, and we had 352 of those respondents completed the full survey. So it's the 352 women that we're talking about today. Um, the respondents were predominantly in the UK, but actually we did reach out and hear from women in over 31 different countries. In terms of educational qualification, I think this is probably the first piece of information that um, felt that really resonated with me. So of, of those 352 women, um, over 300 had a, a degree um, qualification or, or higher and 192 held a postgraduate qualification. So um, we're talking about a, a group of women who are um, very well educated, very well qualified in their field. Um, it's a, a mix predominantly of employees and business owners. We did have some students and I think this is probably a reflection of um, the network of women in sustainability, which tends to be made up of professional women, um, often with a significant amount of experience in the sustainability sector. So just to recap, we've got um, well-qualified women, mostly UK based, um, and the majority of whom are in full-time on employment, um, either as employees or running their own businesses. 
I think it's also relevant just to share with you which sectors or which of the sustainable development goals that um, these women work that women who responded are working in. Um, you can see that climate action was um, was the was the number one sector, and then the next three I think um, are important to note because we'll um, we'll come back to these as we talk through some of the other findings from the report. So communities and sustainable cities, responsible consumption and production and um, partnerships and health and well-being were all, um, were all very well represented in the, in the sample. Um, and I think it's probably also um, important to note here that when we invited, we asked um, all of the women whether or not they saw themselves as a leader. And by that, um, we, we define that as um, having some responsibility or control over um, a team of people, infrastructure, or some finances. And 69% of the respondents said that they did view themselves as a leader. So um, for the respondents to the survey really were very well um, placed to influence and had direct control over some element of, um, of, their, um, of, their, of their role in the sustainability field. So we had um, very well qualified, experienced, as you'll see, um, women who were working in some really core areas across the sustainable development goals. Rianne, I think I'm going to hand over to you now. Lovely. Okay, so um, what I'm going to start sharing now is the first part of, of our findings. And it's this is focusing in, in on this question of, uh, do you feel heard? And initially, when we saw this result, we were like, fantastic. 84% of our respondents said, yes, they were, they felt heard in the workplace. So we thought, wow, that's amazing. Very encouraging headline level. Um, perhaps we, we don't have a, a problem here because we always think about women saying they can't get their voice heard. And, and certainly as, as a network, we talk about amplifying women's voices. There is a, a small difference um, between the employees and business owners, as you can see. Um, but yeah, so this headline level, we thought, OK, maybe we don't have a problem. But then we asked this question of how confident, how confident do you feel um, being able to influence decision making? And this is where it got really interesting, because there's this striking contrast between being heard and then feeling that you've been listened to and that your voice has created an impact in the decision making that you're seeing around you. So for, for all in all respondents, you know, we had 48 percent, you know, said yes, often always I'm influencing that decision making. But 52 percent coming together to say sort of sometimes and rarely. And when you look at the breakdown between employees and business owners, it's those employees again with that sort of sense that they really um, over half, you know, reporting that they, they could not see themselves influencing decision. As part of the research, we've had a lot of um, quotes. There's a lot, there's mountains of, of, of uh, this, this data. And I'm just gonna share a few quotes with you uh, so that you can get a feel of what our respondents were telling us uh, when they were given that opportunity. So, you know, here's one respondent, you know, I have to speak out loud, showing my experience and prove myself every time. I feel like men of any age do not have to prove themselves as much. They can simply brag a bit, say the prepared sentences, and that's all right for them. And then we see this, that people still defer to, to men as they have the better job titles and have five times more confident delivery. Then we looked at specifically those women who said that their voice was heard what did they feel about their um, ability to influence decision making so this was zooming in on those women who who felt that they you know they were having this impact but again we see this pattern um, repeated again which felt pretty surprising so even those respondents who felt that they they were were uh, were heard they could not have um, this impact and so that's one of our key points from this research, that being heard is no way synonymous with being influential. And a few quotes here for you to, to chew on. 
uh, from, from that research. So there are still too many individuals happy to sit in their power and not allow young women a seat at the table. And, and this quote here, um, you always have to be the brightest and most informed person in the room. And most of the time that is not enough anyways, because you are either labeled as opinionated or too ambitious to be given an opportunity. And we saw lots of quotes around this theme about women having to prove themselves before they were seen to be um, acceptable or competent. So this idea that we always have to be proving ourselves, whereas having that sense that men just did not have the same rigor, uh, that, that judgment being made around their competency. And so then uh, final couple of slides on this, you know, we asked our respondents, what did they think the barriers were um, for being heard? And you can see right at the top was this lack of political will to change the status quo. Then we just got the sexism, the bias and discrimination. We have lack of women in senior leadership positions, unwillingness from those already in leadership to relinquish or share power, this gender stereotyping, and quite a way down this list, this lack of confidence and self-belief among women. And, and just to echo what Marianne said, the, this research is very much sort of said, you know, it's not about fixing the women. The women see themselves as leaders and they're not quoting, you know, lack of confidence and their self-belief as the top barrier. It's, it's systemic issues that are being flagged up at the top here. Uh, and finally, that the rest of that, that list. So I'm going to stop there uh, with a few more quotes, though. Um, there this will be picked up. So we had gender bias and discrimination, the, the juggle around parenting. But also there was a recognition with respondents that, that we're experiencing this double bind. So you're a woman trying to be impactful and influential around sustainability, which in itself may not be the top priority or indeed a priority for that organization that you're working in. So we do recognize it's not just these issues around gender, there is our, our unique perspective in sustainability, but we, we would say there's a double bind here for women, um, that it's, it's working against them when they're having to rely on their influencing power. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to Sherry Lee to create some discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Rianne. So the, the WINS Network are a bunch of magnificent, leading, thoughtful, uh, educated women. And I know that because I am one and I've met lots of them. But Mary Ann, some of the stories that you've come across about women in those leadership roles still talking about some of these experiences, just mind blowing. Can you share a couple of those for us, please? Well, yes, I, I, for the book I interviewed about, well, I interviewed about 100 women, about half of whom were incredibly authoritative in their own right, you know, very powerful, successful women, former presidents and prime ministers, high court, Supreme Court justices, generals, bishops, <laughs> movie directors, you name it. And the reason I wanted to talk to them was because I thought if they've experienced the authority gap, all the sort of behavior that I'm writing about, then that must be pretty good proof that all of the rest of womankind has too. You know, if you get right to the top and you're still experiencing it. So I, I think one of the most breathtaking stories came from the former president of Ireland, Mary McAleese. And she told me that she led a delegation to the Vatican to meet the Pope. Very formal occasion, state visit and they're lined up in the audience room with her at the head of the delegation. In comes the Pope, flanked by his cardinals to be introduced to her. And instead, he walks straight past her, sticks his hand out to her husband instead, who's standing next to her, and says, wouldn't you prefer to be president of Ireland rather than married to the president of Ireland? And the delegation was stunned. It was such a breach of protocol, not to speak of being unbelievably rude. And so her husband, of course, didn't take the bait. And Mary McAleese grabbed the Pope's hand, which was hovering in midair, brought it back to herself and said, let me introduce myself. I'm the president of Ireland, Mary McAleese, elected by the people of Ireland, whether you like it or whether you don't. And you think, goodness me, can this still be happening? But I, th I thought what you were what you found out, just going back to the report, what you found out on influence is actually very interesting and very typical, sadly. So I'm sure a lot of women on this call have experienced making a point at a meeting, 
no one really taking a blind bit of notice. A man makes exactly the same point 10 minutes later and is treated like the second coming. OK, we've all had that. And we tend to blame ourselves and beat ourselves up and think, oh, maybe I wasn't confident enough. Maybe I wasn't articulate enough. Maybe he just made the point better than I did. No, you were just too female is the problem. So one research study put a mixed sex group of people into, into a room supposedly to discuss a child custody case. And they deliberately chose that subject because it's actually quite female stereotyped. You'd expect women to be good at it. And they gave the group lots of information about the family concerned, but they gave a few individuals a piece of information that the others didn't have. And when that information was introduced by a man, it was six times more likely to be used by the group in its deliberations than when it was introduced by a woman. So that's how much harder women find it to influence a group, even a group of women as well as men. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting. So I've got a male business partner and we occasionally do meetings together. And the number of times that if there's a pecking order of whose hand is shaky first, yeah. uh, you can imagine that it's very rarely mine. Uh, there's loads in the chat of people agreeing. And uh, yeah, I, th I think that if I was asking people to put hands up, which I don't do because it would just be a sea of yellow and that'd be even more depressing than some of the stories in your book, Marianne. We, we obviously all are recognising this. Bevis, from your point of view and your sort of lived experience, how, how do, you, do you notice this? Have you had to teach yourself to notice this? Well, I, I, I mean, firstly, I, I suppose it's several years ago now, I, I, I did some interviews and wrote articles about, you know, that what you want as a business leader is the best talent in your business coming to the fore, irrespective of, of gender, race, religion, and so on. So, um, you know, if that's your goal, you have to educate yourself around these barriers and what gets in the way. And I'd say that's an ongoing um, uh, uh, process. And, you know, th there are things that you spot, spot and recognize all the time and new initiatives and ideas you, you come up with. But, you know, it, the, the frightening thing, I mean, in, in the survey, it, what's interesting is uh, that there's a very high proportion uh, of women who have higher degrees. So this is this is a subset of, of this. This is probably not reflective of the wider problem, because this is going to be a very authoritative, competent group of people. Uh, and so it should be quite worrying if that's the extent they're able to influence. Imagine what the wider uh, issue looks like. And I suppose I work in a business that will have, you know, by and large, very um, uh, you know, intelligent and, and well qualified uh, women as well. So um, these things make me look on our business um, uh, with a different lens and that, that lived experience, as I say, day to day, consciously thinking, well, what role am I playing and how can I get more of my other male colleagues to realise we have to try and live and address this issue consciously? Uh, so uh, we can come on to some you know, things that we, we work on later, perhaps. But. Yeah, we are it's very difficult for sorry. Just no, no, no. Say, I, I think it's very difficult for men to notice unless they're really looking out for it. Mm -hmm. And I, I use the analogy of it's as if men are swimming in a river with a strong current going in their direction and they can't feel the current, but they see the banks racing past them as they swim and they think, God, I'm a strong swimmer. <laughs> And then they see the women swimming in the opposite direction, struggling to make headway against the current. And they think, oh, they're just not as good at swimming as I am. <laughs> but they don't feel the current and we do. Yeah, recognising those systems that support all of this, either in your favour or otherwise, it is part of the challenge, isn't it, when we're thinking about solutions. And I think starting to explore those uh, barriers, of the, the, to, how do you create the conditions for this? And they're really big things. The big things around uh, that, that were mentioned in the report and that, that you've highlighted yourself around uh, parental leave and some of those practical things, parent, parenting being shared, uh, mm. job sharing being easier. You know, these are not straightforward things to be addressed. And they're certainly not things that we can do as women in isolation, even if we got together and had all of the women doing it, the, the, the structural barriers are significant. And um, there's... There's not questions in the chat. I'm, I'm just mentioning to everyone, if you do have a question, I am looking at the chat if you've got questions and there will be opportunities for me to put those to Marianne and Bevis as we, as we continue. But I think we're gonna go back to the research again. Jenny, is it back to you? If you can- uh, It is, yes, thanks. Moving back. So, um, 
as Rianne's already mentioned, and, and as we say at the beginning of the report, we were really keen to talk to um, two things, really. The, the not fixing the women agenda, but recognising the systemic barriers and the challenges that we're facing as women working in sustainability. And also um, focusing on solutions and thinking about those solutions in the context of um, the wider sustainability agenda and some of the challenges that we face around, in particular, around climate change and leadership for that. So we did ask as part of the survey what women feel that they're bringing to climate leadership. Um, I think really to, um, I suppose there's been some there's been some comments in the chat about validation, but to validate some of the um, some of the behaviours and the leadership styles that we bring um, that are absolutely vital to to sort of um, to the climate change agenda and to um, ensuring that the, the conversations are held in the right way and that we're moving in the right direction around sustainability more generally. So there were <clears throat> there were some very clear themes that emerged when we asked women what they bring to climate leadership. Um, and, and these are they. So um, the first was empathy and compassion. And um, we haven't included it here, but I would go so far as to say as to use the word care as well. Um, an empathetic and, and compassionate approach to leadership. The second is um, a holistic and collaborative approach. There was a lot of talk about um, collaborating rather than competing. And we'll come into that a little bit later when we start to talk about some of the um, some of the, the barriers um, to women in this space. And this is linked as well to, um, you know, what, what women are bringing is the, the lack of power play and tribalism, the opposite of that, which I suppose is the collaborative approach. And a diversity of thought um, that comes with experience, I think. So um, going back to that data around um, the areas that women are working with, um, the length of um, their experience within sustainability as well. The women that we spoke to have a huge amount of experience in the sustainability sector. And um, if I think back to, um, you know, studying, but also working in the sector, it's probably one of the only places I've worked in sustainability where actually it's mostly, in the, particularly in the early days, there was a, there was a good, there was a good mix of men and women. So we've got a lot of women in the, took part of the survey, who have been working in the um, in the sector for fifteen or twenty years? So they were um, they've been in the sector since it's I suppose since the since the very beginning of its uh, I, sort of evolving as a practice. And the fifth theme was around equity in decision making. And again, I'm going to come back to that at the end as well. But we've got some again some quotes to share with you just to um, to illustrate where some of these things have emerged from. So in terms of what women feel they're bringing to the climate change, um, the climate leadership space, this quote illustrates beautifully that piece around um, the moving away from tribalism and political gain. So the ability to reach a consensus, to listen and change a viewpoint based on evidence and the end goal rather than tribalism and political gain. So that shift away from um, competition towards a more collaborative approach. And, um, this particular respondent felt they were bringing compassion, empathy, and calm, which I think is an interesting, um, an, an interesting word to have used, a calmness. The female perspective on climate change and the ability to see past ego to get solutions. So some really, two really beautiful quotes, I think, which pick up on each of those five um, themes that emerged. Sherry Lee, I'm going to pass back to you at this point. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So I know, Marianne, that you're not a sustainability guru, so I'm not asking you for expertise in that regard. But in, in terms of why, you know, what, what, how can we learn? How can we connect the dots between this climate leadership uh, and being the, the, the brilliant qualities that women have and, and what, you've, what you've learned? So in, in terms of that, the difference, I guess, between female leaders and that authority. How, how has it been used um, powerfully? How, where does it work? Well, we've seen all the way through the pandemic how much more successful countries with female leaders have been than those with male leaders. On average, there have been many fewer deaths. Um, so I think, I think it's the ego thing that makes the most difference. So the most unsuccessful countries have been those led by a certain type of man, very ego driven, sort of blustering sense of exceptionalism. Um, I mean, the, the virus 
doesn't, <laughs> the, the virus doesn't say, oh, okay, I won't infect your country because you're such a powerful leader, <laughs> okay? The virus doesn't discriminate. Um, and it's the women who have been unego driven and just said, let's look at the evidence, let's shut the country down if necessary, um, let's put people's lives first before the economy. They're the ones who have actually saved lives. And much bigger academic studies of leadership have shown that women on average are better than men at what's called transformational leadership, which is actually the most effective type of leadership. And it's one which is more collaborative, more democratic, less hierarchical, less directive, engages employees more, inspires them more. And some men are very good at this too, but that's what women tend to be best at. And certainly in terms of climate change, countries that have more women in their parliaments have on average done more for climate change, have passed more rigorous climate change policies. Yeah, there are some great parallels, I think, between the way that female leaders have behaved in the uh, pandemic crisis and, and what will need to happen in terms of the climate crisis. I've got some great questions coming in now that, that relate to the difference in leadership styles and people talking about having to ad adopt their own approach that's not their preferred style to be more aggressive. Just wondered if, um, if there's anything that you can share on some of that. Well, the tr it, confidence is and, and, and what might be thought of as aggressive in a woman, but probably not in a man, um, is a very difficult thing for us to navigate because quite often we're accused of not being confident enough. And people say, oh, we should just send women on assertiveness training courses and then they'll act just like men and they will be taken as seriously as men. I wish it were that simple. It really isn't. I mean, A, it's not surprising that on average we're not as confident as men because of all the behavior that we have to put up with that they don't. If we're constantly having our ideas shot down or not listened to, if we're interrupted, if we're patronized, if we're underestimated, if our expertise is challenged, of course all that's gonna dent our confidence. But if we do act as confidently and as assertively as men, people don't like it. And they start to recoil and it makes them feel uncomfortable. And they start to use words about us like, oh, she's very abrasive, or she's strident or aggressive, as you've just said, bossy, overbearing, bitchy, ball breaking, I'm sure you've heard them all. And these are words that are never used of men who display exactly the same characteristics. So it's a very narrow path that we have to navigate between being not confident enough and therefore disrespected, or confident enough and therefore disliked. And actually, what the most successful authoritative women have managed to overlay a lot of warmth onto their personality to sort of mitigate the dislike that they would otherwise um, come up against for being confident and assertive and authoritative. And, you know, it means you have to smile more, you, you have to try and diffuse situations with humour, you have to read the room with much more emotional intelligence than the men have to bother to do, be very careful not to, you know, tread on any men's egos. and. A, we shouldn't have to do that. Why should we? <laughs> it's often inauthentic. And B, it's exhausting. It's a real burden that men don't have to bear. So I sort of advocate it as a way through, but it's not something I enjoy advocating. And I hope it's only a transitional solution um, and that in a generation or two's time, when we've got many more women in authority, we won't have to do this anymore. Yeah, we can only hope. And all of those descriptions have probably been applied to me. Some of them on <laughs> Me too. Yeah, I'm owning them. We had a great question from Lou Bevis, and I think it was about that third of men who are who don't realise that they're being um, that they're being dismissive or sexist or whatever, whatever term we want to use. And how how what is what do you think the best way is of a female leader or otherwise to get heard? Is it is it is it a presentation? Is it style, or is it a different way of kind of demonstrating competence? Well, I, I mean, I think what I'd first like to say on the third, again, though, is I think we all have a role to play in finding the advocates and extending the, the, the network of people to help address these issues, both in the moment and through behaviours uh, and supporting people in those situations of influence, but, but also then changing the systems in a business that, that hold women back in lots of different ways. So um, I think that's the most in, important thing we need to do. Um, uh, uh sorry you, you what was your specific question on the 
Yeah, so it, the, the, the question was really any tips about how to be heard, I guess, from a male perspective. Sure. What is it, yeah. how, you know, how can we present information or ourselves in a way that is, is going to land well? Yeah, and, and I, I think it's the wrong thing that I should answer that, actually, because I, I, I think that that should be from someone like Marianne, who is a, a recognised thought leader and uh, and has seen brilliant women around the world and, and how they're able to do that. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, is, is it right I give advice on how I go about making sure I'm heard? What, what I would just like to say is I think there are a lot more people out me there than you may realise who would like to support that process of, of ensuring there is influence and people being heard and recognized uh, in, in their businesses. So um, I've tried to encourage my colleagues to sort of work with me almost in advance of the moment or to understand where I need to support them. And not, not just in a business I'm CEO of, I work as part of an international business with you know, women trying to influence internationally who don't report to me and I'm just a peer of and a support of. So. Um, I think that's the, the bit of advice I can most importantly give is to really think about where those um, like minded advocates can be and those supports can be. Can it's quite that? useful for men to have a reverse mentor who is a woman and possibly a woman younger and more junior than them, who can candidly and in private point out to them when they are perhaps being a bit dismissive or not listening enough or talking too much or interrupting. I, I interviewed even the chief of the defense, well, he's just retired, chief of the defense staff, uh, General Sir Nick Carter. And he had a reverse mentor at the Ministry of Defense who was a much younger woman. And he said it was absolutely eye-opening for him because he hadn't realized he was doing this sort of thing. And once she pointed out to him, he thought, oh goodness, yeah, okay. I'm gonna be more careful next time. Yeah. Uh, I think that's so interesting. And um, Bevis, I have a different question then, if I may. So you mentioned earlier about giving feedback to men outside of a meeting, if you'd noticed them interrupting or a certain type of behaviour. How did that go down? Was, was that well received? Were they, uh, yeah, how, how did they feel about that kind of feedback? Yeah, I, I, I think as I've called it out publicly and asked that we let people finish, that has quite a powerful impact. And I think we should all be doing that um, uh, more regardless. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, we um, uh, work with something called Insights, which some of you will be familiar with, which talks about different color preferences in personality types. And so um, to Marianne's earlier point, you know, you, you, you can see where people are acting up to bring out different sort of sides of their personality to have influence and, it, and it's not authentic. And so what we've tried to do with Insights is create a very, um, easy language around that feedback and, and talk to people about where their natural preferences lie and what impact they may have. So sometimes the, the intent is not to interrupt and, uh, uh, and necessarily um, uh, you know, stymie the efforts of, of their female colleagues. Sometimes they are just very high red reference people who are just trying to get to a solution and will cut across anyone. So, so I, I try to do it in that way and, and, and bring it out. But, uh, but if we do have people where I see a pattern, I've, I've specifically spoken to them and you know, the conversation is what it is. And I, I think it's been heard and I have seen a reaction. Yeah, I really like the idea of that sort of neutralising the, the gender issue so that it relates more to a sort of personal and professional development element. I think that's really important. Uh, I'm going to move on in a sec. Tolly has asked a specific question of me, which I'm going to answer, honestly, because uh, it's me and I do. Uh, yes, we have definitely, between myself and my business partner, made decisions specifically based on gender in terms of who, who approaches people, uh, because I know it will go down better sometimes if that's a male-to-male -male thing. Yeah, absolutely do that. And I'm sure other people do as well. So it's just easier. Sometimes just that energy, Marianne, that you talked about, is exhausting because everything that you've said is, is effectively women just have to be better in every single way to be even to remotely levelling that playing field. Um, yeah, so women are twice as likely as men to say that they have to produce evidence of their competence. And black women are nearly twice as likely as white women to say that. We haven't talked about intersectionality, but of course, the gaps are even wider for women of colour, women with disabilities, working class women. And I, and I think that's where the solutions element starts to come in, because we can, as, uh, as, as well, speaking for myself, white women, we can ha ha experience what that is like to open the doors for other people, to use that allyship approach, to call things out in meetings. So it's not like we, we wouldn't be familiar with some of the solutions that I think we're gonna go on to uh, think about. 
We're going back to the evidence, I think. Is it is it Jenny again or is it Rian? It's me. <laughs> I will hand over back okay. over to you, Rian. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we asked our respondents what were the solutions? What did they think helped them get their voice heard? So for employees, right at the top was this proactive uh, particip participation. So what I should say is what I've got listed here is, is um, a thematic analysis from all the comments. So we have got a lot of comments and we've done this thematic analysis on it. And this is what's been drawn out. Uh, so those in bold here are the ones that were mentioned most frequently by the respondents. Second was this good networking, this good network building, having this, this collaboration and having expertise and knowledge with proven a proven track record. And I've spotted already in the chat uh, with one lady um, was talking about how she, you know, has been predominantly manages a, a team of, of men. And it's this expertise and track record that she's been able to demonstrate that has really supported her ability to be heard. And then the culture, this supportive and motivating work culture that um, Bevis has, has been talking to a little bit. And then we've also got listed for employees some of the a mixture then of the sort of assertive attitude and these personal skills, good, good communication skills, having the facts and figures to hand and so on. For um, business owners, having the confidence right up front came, you know, was top of the list by a long way. Expertise, again, good communication, coming up with, with prop, you know, proper solutions, tangible solutions. So I love the fact that this was about the competence. It was showing that you've got the competence, not being afraid of the, the competence and allowing your competence to, to shine through. Again, though, networking and, and looking after your reputation was mentioned by many having this visibility um, a, a bit more um, shared. So employees also, a lot of people talking about having this passion, credibility, and interestingly about the, the role model, modeling around them, having women in leadership positions, having good leadership and management that would be supportive, having young male leadership. I thought this was very interesting. So uh, clocking that, the younger generations are far more um, open, you know, do not see, uh, perhaps haven't got embedded um, in behaviours that are, are, are detrimental, that they, they are far more open to, to, to women being able to just be themselves. Um, and then voicing out, being able to voice out. And some more um, ideas and more thoughts that came from our business owners, uh, proportion of the um, sample from, from our respondents, having this knowledge again. So again, this focus on, on competency, but again, relationships, you know, thinking about leadership qualities, being able to, to show and demonstrate that experience. Um, and having, uh, again, that sort of supportive work environment. So I just want to share a couple of uh, quotes um, that we've just picked out. Oh, I, sorry, I should have said, we also asked about the network, of course, because we've been around since 2014. And for us as the, the Women's Sustainability Network, we, it's all about enabling women to um, be heard, be influential, create that impact and be a force for good. So you can imagine we were quite delighted uh, that we did get this, resp this uh, response over in terms of would you recommend the network with 86% saying yes. When you looked at the no's, they were mainly women who actually didn't know much about us uh, and had come to the survey um, fresh, hadn't come to the survey um, through being part of our community. And when we dive into why, why would they recommend us? What is it we're offering? It's, I would say, a combination of not just what we're sharing and the fact we're bringing people together, it's how we do it. And we talk a lot about the psychological safe space that we very proactively create through our events, uh, through our network hubs around the country, and why we have focused on being um, for women, because it's having this judgment-free environment. And as we've often said, it's, this quote here, it's intangible, but profound, profound. It's when you finally experience that space to, to be heard, to be listened to, to practice, that we start to see uh, some of, some of the, um, the benefits of having this kind of network around you and be, be a part of. OK, so that's the solutions um, that came from our respondents.
back to you, Sherry Lee, to talk more about the solutions uh, with our panel. Thank you. And we've got a question from Tali, which I really like, which is whether Mary Ann thinks that there is a specifically female way of being heard. Uh, I think we try to be more emollient, uh, possibly sometimes a bit more hesitant. Uh, we smile more, we use warmth, or ever, we try terribly hard not to be in any way threatening, because as soon as we become threatening, which means probably acting as the men do, some men, I'm sure Bevis doesn't, but some men uh, will immediately put up their defences and think, I don't want to be influenced by her. So that's the way we are forced to behave, doesn't mean we want to be like that. But I think that's the way we have to behave in order to get influence. How does that relate to the transformational leadership element that you described though? So women are better in that transformational leadership space. Is that because of those ways of working or in spite of them? Uh, well, well, of course I was talking about not, not, you know, if you're already a leader, you don't have to do a lot of that sort of thing. Um, but actually they are quite similar in a way because they're both based on emotional intelligence, aren't they? They're both based on, you know, understanding the people you're working with and trying to get the best out of them rather than just telling them what to do. Yeah, and there's lots of uh, comments in the chat around this reverse mentoring idea and not just in relation to gender, but also relating to age and other areas where we intersect with other um other things that, that may cause people uh, challenges in, in terms of leadership? And, and is there anything in terms of that intersectionality that we can just explore a little bit? Bevis, is that something that you pick up at uh, Trudos? Yes, I mean, uh, everything we're talking on today obviously has um, broader elements to it. And uh, we, we actually just come to the end of a three-year strategy we put in place on ED&I more broadly um, in, in the organisation. And we still have a long way to go because we still have a gender pay gap because we have, whilst we have a lot of equality at the senior end of the organisation, at the more junior end, we have a bias towards more women. And then we lose a lot of women, too many women, um, through childcare and everything else in the middle management tier, which becomes male-dominated. So you automatically, in the way it's calculated, create a gender Bias, but then you see the overlay uh, of ethnicity and so on, and we've got much further to go. We're getting much, much more um, representative, and we over-index in terms of people applying from uh, um, diverse communities uh, in terms of the population of Bristol, and we over-index in terms of the people we appoint. But you see those overlays and people then struggling to get through to uh, higher levels in the organisation. And you also see it in our customer base. So we're thinking a lot about how do we as a lender and investor influence the organisations that we are also investing in and how do we ask these questions about what they're doing and what they're putting in place uh, around these same sort of topics. Yeah, and I, and I think that uh, that does make the difference in, in terms of the, the combination of the, the human element of, and the structural element Bevis said a question that was around what you think might be some drivers that we might, and I will ask you as well, Marianne, but in terms of what might the drivers be for men to be better advocates? What, what can we, how can we persuade them? I think we're going to all have to take some actions away from this that are both personal and professional. Uh, and we've got some ideas like the reverse mentoring. How, how can we, how can we pitch it? Well, I, I, as I said, from my own personal experience, I think it's in every man's interest that you you don't work in a sort of alpha male uh, environment to be your own best self and to thrive and to just have a more enjoyable, better working environment. So that's one angle. There's countless studies that show diverse organisations outperform with diverse boards and diverse management teams. Uh, and equally, you know, um, I, I think, it, you know, the vast majority of men have sisters or have daughters uh, and so on and we should be appealing to just their general um, sense of responsibility to uh, the people they care about you know and, and make it a more human conversation as well and uh, I'm sure that's not as comprehensive as um, Mary Ann will answer but uh, you know I, I think those are the things that I have front of my mind when I'm trying to talk to some of my male colleagues. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, actually, if you're a man and you treat your female colleagues and subordinates with exactly the same respect that you do to your male ones, 
they will really notice and they'll really appreciate it. They will love you for it. They will be much more loyal workers. They'll work harder. They'll be less likely to leave because they'll say, I've got a great boss or I've got a great colleague. And if you're lucky enough as a man to have a female boss, then you'll probably find that she's also a very good boss to work for because on average, uh, employees who work for female bosses actually rate them more highly than male bosses, though the male bosses rate themselves more highly than the female bosses, which makes me laugh. Um, so it's, it's, it is actually a men's interest and actually broader than the workplace. There's some fantastic evidence to show that both in more gender equal countries and in more gender equal relationships in which the straight relationships, that is, in which the men and the women share the chores and the childcare pretty equally. Not only are the women happier and healthier, which you would expect, and the children are happier and healthier, do better at school, have fewer behavioral difficulties, but the men themselves are also happier and healthier. So they're twice as likely to say they're satisfied with their lives, half as likely to be depressed, much less likely to get divorced. They drink less, they smoke less, they take fewer drugs, they sleep better at night. And here's the absolute clincher, they get more frequent and better sex. So guys, this is really in your interest. <laughs> Oh, in terms of drivers, Marianne, I think you just hit the sweet spot there. How does that how does that relate to so one of the um, elements in your book was around how the pale male stale humans are feeling about this? And that I think was it not leveling up but being ground down? Is is there something being around flattened. that? Flattened, sorry, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Can you say a little bit about that? I found that really interesting. Yeah, well, those there is this sort of sense of entitlement that I think boys and men, not all, but a lot of boys and men just grow up with. And you know, suppose a black woman gets a job which uh, she is equally qualified for, they will say, Why did she get my job? And who said it was your job? <laughs> if she's just as well qualified, it's just as much her job as your job, but they see it as her stealing my job. And therefore, instead of seeing an equal playing field, a level playing field as fair, they see it as unfair to them. And I mean, just a, an anecdotal example of this was when I was researching the book, I hadn't finished writing it yet. I was talking to a former editor of mine and he said, oh, your thesis is completely out of date. Um, thereby, by the way, uh, uh, illustrating exactly what I'm writing about, that a woman's expertise gets challenged by a man who knows much less than she does. But anyway, he said, no, it's completely out of date. I sit on loads of um, appointment panels these days and we only ever appoint women to boards when I haven't got a chance anymore. And I said, really? I think you'll find that's not the case. He said, no, I, I can tell you, men don't get appointed to boards anymore. So the very next day, I'm on an email list which sends you how many men and women get appointed to boards in the previous month. And so I counted and it was 20 men and 19 women. So actually equal, which was great, but to him, it was zero men and 100% women. And, uh, and I, of course I sent it to him. <laughs> Yeah, quite. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, last chance for questions when we come back after this next set of slides from Jenny, please. So get your keyboard fingers tapping away. Jenny, handing over to you. Thanks, Jody. Um, so just to finish on, um, I guess, a sort of solutions flavour, because that was something we felt very strongly about. Um, we invited um, or women to talk about um, how or what are, what are the what are the, the sort of ways of resolving the barriers to gender parity and climate leadership. And again, we got a really strong sense of where some of those systemic and structural barriers are, um, with some suggestions about how to you know what the barriers are and where and how, what how we might tackle them. So the first we've touched on, in fact, reassuringly, I think we've touched on all of these. Um, the first is, is is a is a very for me it's a very sort of starts with a very operational perspective around flexible working job sharing and this 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 need to shift the societal paradigms around family gendered parenting and caring responsibilities. Um, you know it's disappointing to be starting with this one, but but it, it came across very strongly, and I think um, I think is it's still a huge barrier. So. The second was around um, was linked to this piece around collaboration versus competition. So actually cultivating and rewarding cultures where collaboration is um, is really is is valued, and rather than this um, 
a sort of competitive uh, culture and the behaviours that go with that. The third, um, again, we've touched on this, is around um, men advocating for female voices and for, for, for women leaders. And um, I think I mentioned at the beginning, in terms of our next steps with any further research or um, extra data that we collect, we need to think about the voices of those individuals who we haven't spoken to, but who are very much part of this conversation. Um, the fourth was around um, the amplification, the amplification of women as leaders in climate change versus victims of climate change and um, recognizing the inherent value of women. I actually think there's like the two slightly different things here. Um, one is about understanding women as being part of the solution and then thinking about the value of the leadership and the leadership styles that they're bringing to that solution. Think about ways we can amplify that. Um, the fifth, again, feels very um, operational. It's about investment in um, funding, education, training and financial literacy um, for women working in the field, but also um, in, in the amplification of their voices. And this one was really interesting. So um, I'd, I'd like to know more about what full engagement really looks like and feels like for people but um it was a i guess an acknowledgement for me that there are lots of policies and, initi and initiatives around diversity and inclusion but a sense that actually we're not all really engaging with them in some way and so um thinking about what that might mean and how we might bring that into our own practice i'm going to leave you with there were again i mean rian's already talked about the gazillion quotes that we've got we've we've got an absolute a really rich um, set of, of quotes which illustrate, um, you'll, you can read more about them in the report, but illustrating these points beautifully. But there was one that stood out for me and actually I think it brings us full circle right back to the first bit of data that, um, that Rianne presented around um, women feeling that they're being heard but that actually they can't see their voices represented in the decisions and, and they can't see their influence in, um, in necessarily. So this is a really beautiful quote from someone who uh, responded to the survey. So leadership isn't just about 50-50 parity in the room. It's about that parity in who speaks, who is listened to, and who is felt and who feels included, who's felt to be included. And, and that's the that's the end of our sort of presentation to you in terms of the data that we found. But I hope you feel we've come full circle with that, um, all the way from the those initial findings, but also to some of the um, the potential solutions linked to some of those big systemic barriers that women are telling us they're facing. So, thanks, Jenny. Back to you. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Really interesting in terms of the findings from this, how it relates and uh, correlates with the, the research that Mary Ann's uh, done, the experience that Bevis has had and the work that he's trying to do. I wonder if the panel want to leave us with just a final thought as we move as a network into this kind of action planning. What are we going to do now with all of this information? Because gathering the information is only half of the battle. So we're going to break out in our next section and, and get into the nitty gritty of, um, of what we can do. Any, any last thoughts to leave us with? Mary Ann. Well, let's see some more women at COP27 than we saw at COP26 for a start. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's on Rianne's to-do list, I heard her say yesterday. <laughs> we'll hold you to it, that. <laughs> Bevis, any, any, any last thoughts before we inspire us? No, no pressure. Inspire us before we head off to, to do some action planning. Oh, well, I mean, it's great to see there are a few men on this call, but we, we need to think how do we make the topics we've discussed today and the Women in Sustainability Network broaden its appeal and for more men to engage with this. Uh, and I'd certainly like to connect with um, the, you know, anyone on the call who would like to around uh, trying to do that and, uh, and provide that point of advocacy wherever I can more, more generally, really. Um, I think something I've observed that I didn't get a chance to say earlier is I think women are much more talented in showing vulnerability than men. And I think that often gets in the way of why men talk a lot, why they dominate, why they are, you know, set on certain goals. And I think part of this issue is allowing culture in organisations where people can be vulnerable, be them, their true selves to 
uh, open up and neutralize um, some of the topics. So uh, I'd like to leave you that as a final thought, really, because uh, we need to appeal to men's vulnerability as much as anything, in my view. Oh, that's a fantastic close. Thank you, Bevis. Really appreciate that. And thank you so much to Marianne and to Bevis for sharing their uh, expertise, their thoughts, their experience, and to Rianne and Jenny for taking us through that report. CC, I am looking to you because I think you are about to put us into breakout rooms. Is that right? This is where the magic happens. Uh, let's call it that. Is, is that what's happening? I've lost CC on my screen. That's just a, a, a sea of faces. I, I, I think, think that is what's happening, but I think we've also got some questions to leave people with, or just some prompts for the breakout rooms as well. So I'll, I'll share that. And if we can invite in the interests of focusing on solutions and provoking some action if we can invite people to think about these things in in their breakout room so what stands out and resonates with you from today's conversation and what will you be doing differently when you leave the event today doesn't have to be huge doesn't have to be fixing cop 27 Rianne, it's okay um but but what will you be doing differently when you leave the event today So that's the provocation as we head into the breakout rooms. You should be seeing an invitation to disappear. Are we losing people? We are. <laughs> in, a, in a good way. <laughs> in the best possible way. <laughs> Great. The invitations are arriving. So everybody join when you see it. I've got mine. So I've got a few people to go. They might need to be assigned CC. Sometimes people with an old type of Zoom might need you to, to um, proactively put them into their rooms if, they, if they're unable to accept it. I'm gonna go and join room five. And we also need the recording to be stopped say so that or paused I should say um so the first thing that um I've really been thinking about for a while in the conversation today that we made me think about is that I often find myself in a position where I am facilitating conversations in a room um, and they are often around sustainability issues and I think I am going to really think hard about how I can make sure that voices are heard um and that we see those voices reflected in the outcomes of those conversations. So um, I'm going to use my platform to make sure that that happens for all the voices in the room. Um, and I'm going to start doing that on Thursday in my first, in my, you know, in, in my next workshop. I, I think um, I'm going to give that some thought as I'm doing my planning. So that's a very, I suppose that's a small thing and it's a fine tuning of my, of my existing practice. Um, my second thing is around... Um, a conversation that I had over tea last night and as we've been having the conversations today it keeps coming back to me so I um I live in a house with four boys and um they're all younger than me some of them much younger than me one of them a little bit younger and as I was describing what I'm doing today um my three children said wow that sounds amazing and then they said two things that were really resonated one was um why has no one done that before why has no one done that piece of research for? What, what's that about? That's weird, mum. And the second thing was going back to that human piece. It just, it sounds as if what you're talking about is being, is for people to be a really good human, for them to be kind. So I think what I'm going to do is make sure that I go and have those conversations with other generations, because I think what's coming behind is not what we are living now. It's very different to my lived experience. So I think that's, probably that those are my two actions i'm going to go and make sure i test a few more things out with other generations um, and at, go outside of my bubble i suppose yeah um and, and i will thank everyone for coming along today particularly to those of you who have stayed for the breakout room that's been that's been great and we it is just the beginning i know we keep saying that and we're hoping to be able to continue this conversation based on even more research thank you brilliant thank you jenny yeah
Yes, I think um, we went into this research expecting to hear about women feeling that they can't get their voice heard. And to have this really important distinction being drawn out that it's about influence, about authority. Um, I, 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 you know, I was quite taken aback. Um, and so, as, as Jenny said, there's a lot we've still got to unpack with, the, with the, all the amazing respondents um, that we've got. But even with what we have been able to, act, to analyze so far, I think this report now is the start of a new strategic direction for the Women's Sustainability Network. And we'll certainly be using it to inform what we focus on, what we'll be inviting our lovely hub leads around the country and overseas to offer as topics for, for conversations in, in online events and, and in-person events. And certainly for our membership, our, the Women's Sustainability Digital Community, which is um, actually just reopening uh, this month. And I'm just sharing the link there in the chat if you want to have a quick look at it. It's going to be open for the whole of March. But we'll be really looking at this amplifying women leadership and, and supporting um, our members to have, have that voice and to, to reach out and cultivate allies and, and so on. And I think that one of the things that's that's come forward for me is this whole issue about men uh, as advocates, as allies, and how can we, without affecting what we do uh, within our space here, we know the psychologically safe space when it is women only is so important, but how from that, what could we do in order to equip everybody with the confidence and language to go and speak with men and, and raise this with, with, the, with the, the, the men in their lives, as well as the, 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 their organizations and so on, so that we, we, we do feel that we're, we're equipped to have these kind of conversations. And, and with that lovely way of, of speaking that Marianne had and Bevis, yeah, of course it makes sense to have everybody's talents equally heard, et cetera, particularly right now when the planet needs us so desperately to have this leadership. So I'd love to normalize that and, and, and to find a way in which we can play our part and then on a very personal front, um, uh, my, my husband joined us today, which was brilliant. But I think for me, I have two, two men in my life uh, with my teenage son and my husband. But I think it's for me, it's also remembering to, to model and to find ways to talk to this in, in my personal life. Because, um, they're you know, being resistant to influence. I find that fascinating and I am witnessing the, the whole journey I've been on with this research over the last six months, being seeing that being push up in my in, in my face at home and then wow this is interesting you know even here I'm, I'm I'm seeing I'm not having having the influence I want want to have sometimes so I think a personal sort of commitment to take it on board and then to use this research uh to really help us strategically with where we go with the network and we're always open to 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 hearing from you all over what you think we should be focusing on and what we what we can do and and the best address is the one that's on the report but contact at women in sustainability.net is our sort of broadly email um, so do uh, send me what you think send me your thoughts um, on on that email as well um, over to you Shirley to, to, to wrap up there's a few questions I think um, we're looking for somebody to run a hub the the winds hub in London um, Esther we did have some people keen but they've uh, they've not taken it forward so if you want to message me uh, Rian at women's sustainability.net I'm happy to talk to anybody who's interested in setting up a hub in their area um, we're certainly expanding and we are sort of replacing uh, in, in a few a few places as well yeah it's been a bit tricky hasn't it the in-person things but I think that's starting again anyone that is joining the uh, online membership though, we will be asking how you have <laughs> uh, done some of these activities that you've promised, the, the things that you've been thinking about. As Brianne said, we will keep talking about it. It is so important for climate leadership, mm. so important. We have to have women's voices heard. So thank you, Rianne, for uh, putting on the event. Thanks for including me. Thanks to everybody for their contributions. Uh, as, as you say, absolutely the start of the journey. Mm. And can I say thank you to you, Sherry Lee? Uh, it's been brilliant. I also want to say thank you to Sissy, who's been here behind the scenes, making it all flow. Um, Bevis Watts was stayed for the breakout, which was brilliant. I should be sending some formal thanks to him. And of course, obviously, to, to, to Marianne Seacart for her fantastic sharing her experience. And also to you, Jenny, for uh, doing a fantastic job bringing this research all together. It's been uh, a delight working with you on it all. Oh, what a what a love in to finish with <laughs> it's the wind's just, way just wish we could have a 
celebratory something. I know, I know. Where's the drink? <laughs> Where's the drink? Everyone has a fantastic afternoon. I think we'll leave it there. Brilliant. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a lovely afternoon. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.